we bring you former Solicitor General of the United States, Ted Olson, who served in this role from 2001 to 2004 under President George W. Bush. From 1981 to 1984, during Ronald Reagan's presidency, Mr. Olson served as Assistant Attorney General. He also served as President Reagan's private counsel. In 2010, Time Magazine named Mr. Olson one of the 100 most influential people in the world. He is one of the nation's premier appellate and United States Supreme Court advocates. He's argued 65 cases in the Supreme Court and has prevailed in over 75% of those cases. These include the two Bush versus Gore cases arising out of the 2000 presidential election, and most recently, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security versus Regents of the University of California, challenging the recent cancellation of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA. And now, please welcome Theodore B. Olson, Class of 1962, and University President Christopher Callahan. Thank you, Christopher. Good afternoon. Happy Veterans Day to all of our Pacific students, alumni, faculty, and staff who have served our country in the armed forces. Today, we have a very special edition of Leading Voices, our series of conversations with the best and brightest alumni of University of the Pacific. It is a great honor to welcome back to Pacific, Ted Olson. Mr. Olson is quite simply one of the leading legal minds of our times. His extraordinary career includes serving as the nation's Solicitor General, the person who represents the federal government before the Supreme Court. Now a partner in the Washington law firm of Gibson Dunn, Mr. Olson has been honored at the highest levels of the legal profession. Some of those accolades include the American Bar Association Medal, which is the ABA's highest honor. He is a two-time recipient of the US Justice Department's Edmund Randolph Award, the highest award for public service and leadership. Mr. Olson is, a, is regularly named by the National Law Journal as one of America's top 100 most influential lawyers. He also has been named the best lawyer in Washington by Washingtonian Magazine and as one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. I could go on and on and on, but let me simply say, welcome back to University of the Pacific, Ted Olson, and thank you for taking time out of your very, very busy schedule to join us today. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, it, it, it's great to look at at least a piece of uh, University Pacific. My memories of my time there are very, very indelible and very fond. Um, I am deeply grateful for my time at, at, at in Stockton at UOP. Uh, it was COP when I started and UOP when I finished it. And it was a wonderful experience. And it brings tears to my eyes. Uh, uh, to just to even think about that and to see a piece of it in the background there. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Patty. And, and maybe when, when things return to normal, we could have you back to campus because I, I know all of the students and faculty would love, would love to see you and spend some time with you. I would love that. Thank you. Uh, you know, let's start off. We have uh, experienced perhaps our nation's most tumultuous and divisive presidential election. Uh, and as we know, President Trump is challenging the voting results in numerous states. You, of course, successfully argued Bush v. Gore, the Supreme Court case involving the 2000 presidential election between George W. Bush and Al Gore. Given that extraordinary vantage point, can you tell us what we should be looking for during uh, this year's appeals of the presidential election results uh, as they unfold over the next few days and weeks, and what advice uh, you might have for, uh, for the campaign's attorneys as they, as they enter into this world? Well, I'm happy to say that I have not been involved in any of this litigation, uh, and I'm not about to give advice to the attorneys on either side. It seems to me they've got enough on their hands with their cases. There is a big difference, the Bush versus Gore episode, um, which I'm sure many of your students were pretty young um, if, they, if they were still in, ex if they were actually in existence. Because as someone was reminding me, it was 20 years ago. It seems like just yesterday for some of us, but that's a long time ago. Uh, and it's the same amount of time between uh, uh, when Ronald Reagan was elected uh, and that election, 20 years. But the, but the former, uh, the Reagan-Carter uh, election seems so much further away. Um, the Bush versus Gore battle was five weeks. Um, it was a very, very close election. Uh, it was uh, within the margin of error, and the outcome of the election depended upon who 
who won Florida uh, and Florida's electoral college votes. And that resulted in, uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, President Bush, Governor Bush, then President Bush, winning that, that uh, contest by a small number of votes, something under 500 votes, depending upon what you counted. The media went back and counted it again and counted it again and came to the conclusion that Bush indeed won the election on the count. But there were five weeks of litigation. We wound up arguing in the United States Supreme Court twice. Part of the litigation was down in Florida. Then part of it was in Washington, D.C. Um, and um, in the United States, two United States Supreme Court arguments in the course of 10 days. Uh, but remember, it was only one state and a, one, a very small number of votes. Now, the contest, to the extent that there really is one, uh, is in Arizona and is in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Georgia um, and so forth. So many, many, many states and tens of thousands of votes separate the candidates uh, according to the counts that have come in so far. Um, and so I think it's very, very different. It would be very, very uh, difficult for uh, the incumbent president to overturn uh, those elections. Um, there, he would have to uh, find some way to overcome tens of thousands of votes in many, many states. So basically, if you're thinking about this objectively, that's not going to happen. Um, so it's a very different thing, but people all thought about Bush versus Gore, and I kept um, getting requests from media to come and talk about the similarities. And I basically avoided those because I wanted to stay a little bit out of the fray and watch from a, a more secure distance. Thanks. Thanks, Ted. On, on more of a, uh, just as, a, as an astute observer of, of the political landscape in, in Washington and, and not from your legal perspective, I'm just wondering, what is your what does your gut say about this transition of power that's going to be coming up? This you know there is there are some folks as you as you know um, uh, some commentators who have expressed concern uh, about a, a peaceful a peaceful transition, uh, which of course is the hallmark of our of our democracy. I would just love to hear your your thoughts again, and obviously not a legal analysis, but just as a uh, as a longtime observer of all things Washington. Well, I was saying before the election when to the extent that I was on a program or two to talk about it, that it will be a lot easier for the American people if there's a very pronounced result. And because of what I was saying a moment ago, that there are many states and there are tens of thousands of votes separating the candidates in those states. I was watching television this morning uh, when I got up and was, was doing some exercising that 70% of the uh, American people do accept the fact that um, uh, Vice President, former Vice President Biden has won this election. That's a huge number of the American people. That's Republicans and Democrats. I think that the, to the extent that there is heel, heel dragging, foot dragging in the administration, maybe from the top with respect to this, that is gradually disappearing. Uh, and I suspect it will wither away uh, there are many people in the administration, including President Trump, that do not like the outcome, do not believe the outcome, and are not probably ever going to accept the outcome. But I think that most people will, and most people in Washington will. I think members of Congress are coming around. I do think that this will be a peaceful transition. Uh, there are going to be bumps in the road. There are going to be disputes during the confirmation proceedings for the president's nominees for cabinet posts and, and judicial posts and that sort of thing, uh, depending upon how the votes come out in Georgia. Uh, as it stands now, the Republicans have 50 Senate seats, uh, the Democrats have 48, and there's a runoff on the two Senate seats in Georgia. If the Republicans win uh, either just one or, or, or two of those seats, they will have a re relatively firm grip on the confirmation process. I do think from what I've heard from a number of the senators, and I know many of them, uh, that they're going to be receptive to the idea that a new president, President Biden, should be able to select the people that work and serve him in those cabinet positions. And except for controversial figures, I think that, I hope, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic that that should go more smoothly uh, than the than the fights that have led up to this point. Thank you.
you know, Ted, when, when you were a uh, an undergraduate here here at Pacific, you studied history and communications, and you uh, and you were an editor at at the Pacific. Head. And I'm just I'm just curious, what does your uh, news habits look like today? What 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 sources of information do you go to? Uh, well, uh, to keep yourself I'm up? a ferocious reader of newspapers. I read. I, I re, we receive at home the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, other newspapers I get at the office, uh, some political newspapers like Politico uh, and things like that. I'm a, some, I get up early and do some exercise at my age that's recommended, uh, probably at any age it's recommended, but particularly at my age. And so I'll turn from one channel to the next. They're not all objective in, in down the middle of the road, but if you listen to both sides, you hear both sides. So I'm a pretty much avari uh, avaricious reader uh, and, and viewer of what's going on politically in our country. Um, it's, it's in part something that was, um, uh, I, that I always had when I was growing up as a kid and also followed uh, as a student at Pacific. I like newspapers. Um, having had a chance to be the editor of the paper there, um, I just believe in it. I believe that it's a great opportunity for people to express conflicting views, somewhat controversial views. Um, and it's, it, as a student, I enjoyed the fact that you were allowed a certain latitude to make mistakes and say certain outrageous things and sort of get away with it. But that's a part of the learning process. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly right. Um, you know, we, we talked. We, we talked about Bush v. Gore. Uh, there's a much more recent case uh, that is particularly relevant to our campus community, and quite frankly, to all of higher education. Uh, and 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 our viewers may not realize, uh, but that earlier this year, you were the lead counsel uh, in an effort uh, by a coalition of universities. I will add, including proudly, uh, University of the Pacific, to sue the federal government uh, to block the Homeland Security uh, plans from revoking visas for international students. Uh, who we planning on studying online. And the administration quickly changed course on that. But, but I was hoping you could share, because it's so important to so many of our students, certainly our international students, but really our entire community. I was hoping you could share a little bit with us about, uh, about that important issue and, your, um, and, and what your legal arguments were uh, in opposing that move to revoke the visas. Well, that was a part of litigation that uh, we participated in. It was, it was Certainly not just me, it was as, as you pointed out, many universities, many law schools and many states participated in that litigation. Uh, and I was given a leading role and I was thrilled to have that opportunity. I previously had worked on it and it, it's, it's associated in many people's minds with the Dreamers case, the deferred action for uh, childhood arrivals, the young people that had been brought to this country by their parents or their families when they were one, two, seven, eight years of age and really had no intention to break the law. Uh, and, the, and the Obama administration had deferred uh, any action on them and gave them a certain sense of, of comfort and an opportunity to be employed and so forth. And I led the battle there in the Supreme Court. Again, it was a lot of people, including uh, law school faculties and other law firms and solicitors general from various states, including California. Um, and we won that case in the Supreme Court. The, in, to, to a cer certain degree, there were some similarities. Here, we were arguing that the administration, whatever powers it might have, and the executive has great powers with respect to immigration and decisions having to do with our borders. The courts have always given great latitude to the president, the executive branch, with respect to protecting our borders, protecting, uh, securing our borders, and having a lot to say about uh, in immigration and the like. Congress sometimes passes laws that are very, very vague, so there's a lot of room in the joints. We were making the arguments in both of those cases that the administration, whatever powers it had to do certain things, it had to do them right. It had to comply with the Administrative Procedures Act. That meant that when it was making decisions affecting large numbers of individuals, uh, that had relied upon previous decisions. It had to explain those decisions. It had to do it by the numbers and it had to do it correctly. Uh, fortunately, we were able to convince the United States Supreme Court that we were correct. Uh, and much like the Supreme Court had rejected 
um, uh, certain claims that the administration had made with respect to conducting the census uh, and whether citizenship questions could be on the census. The court basically said in that case, and we relied uh, on that case a lot when we were making our arguments in uh, Dreamer's case particularly, that whatever powers the administration had, it had to be, had, had to be done according to the law and, and not uh, capriciously. Um, and that is to, to oversimplify, of course, uh, that's basically the argument we were making. And, and, and we're, we're very proud that we were successful because it affected, in the Dreamers case, 700,000 families. Um, and in the other cases, hundreds of thousands of individuals. So um, it made a big difference and we were very gratified to be a part of that litigation. Thank you. Thank you for, and your team for all of your efforts on, on that. Um, Mr. Olson, let's, let's bring you back to Pacific, uh, if, if we could. And, and, and as, as you know, um, today, as well as uh, when you were here, uh, really the hallmark of, of a Pacific education is the individualized attention uh, and the one-on-one -on -one relationships between faculty and students. And in the past, uh, I know you've talked about uh, Professor Paul Winters. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what role Professor Winters played uh, in your Pacific education and, uh, and in your... And, in your thinking in life going forward? Well, let me put it this way. I came close to winding up at Stanford. Uh, I grew up in Los Altos, um, and that's right next door to Stanford, of course. And I had been offered a Naval ROTC scholarship to go to Stanford. Um, they found out towards the end of it, as I took a physical, that I'm a little bit colorblind. In those days, they were very picky about who is going to be an officer in the Navy. And they decided, well, we don't want somebody that may have trouble distinguishing between red and green. So um, uh, I, 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 my second choice was Pacific, and I was, had been a place that I was interested in because it was not too far from the Bay Area. Um, I loved the campus. Uh, I loved the size of the campus, and I was very lucky uh, that the Navy decided that my eyesight wasn't good enough for them because I wound up at Pacific and what I found there is an environment that in, encouraged, because it was a smaller institution in part, and because of the attitude and traditions of Pacific, uh, and because of the quality of the administration and the faculty, there was an emphasis on individual uh, liberty and individual opportunities to do various different things. And just to summarize briefly, I, I worked on the newspaper, uh, and in journalism, various episodes, I had my own little radio station and um, radio program. I was a little disc jockey, a uh, very poor one, I'm sure. I, I participated in the theater programs. Uh, I participated, most importantly, on the forensics team under Paul Winters. Uh, and that was, a, as it still is today, a very formidable force in the United States. Uh, Paul Winters was a a giant of a man in that field, forensics and uh, communications throughout the United States. He was also a wonderful, wonderful teacher. Uh, he believed in enormous diversity on our team. Uh, he encouraged people of every background to be a part of the team and, and, and gave great opportunities to young women to participate in the debate team. Um, and we were very, very successful, oratory, interpretive speech, um, in, in, in impromptu speech, uh, deb intercollegiate debate. We went all over the United States. Uh, and I thought that was the greatest thing in the world because it was an opportunity to learn how to make persuasive arguments, uh, to listen to the other side, to do research. As most people know, you would argue the affirmative of proposition one hour and the negative the next hour. So you learn to listen to the other side uh, and to be objective about what uh, other people were saying. Um, and it, and it, it was a great opportunity for teaching. I also participated a little bit in the student government and fraternity life and things of that nature. What really stands out to me, of course, the, the debate team was number one. Um, but the other thing that stands out to me is that the opportunity was given to everyone on the campus to participate as a young person try things out, make mistakes, uh, learn what you're good at, and then practice it and, um, and have opportunities all across the board. I can't imagine 
a better opportunity. And I think it's much better at a place like Pacific than it was. I went on from Pacific to the University of California at Berkeley to go to law school. Well, as you know, that was tens of thousands of people at Berkeley compared to a couple of thousand or 3,000 at Pacific. Uh, I think it's much better to have uh, opportunities at a smaller school. You have, uh, I don't think I could have done all those things at Stanford or Berkeley or some other place. Um, uh, I'm sure you get a good education there, but I got a great one at Pacific because of the opportunities and the faculty and particularly Paul Winters. That's, well, that's, 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 that's wonderful to hear. And thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot in higher education, especially these days about the liberal arts and, and, and particularly the humanities, social sciences, um, and whether or not, um, um, you know, what utility uh, that education has. And I think you and I are very much of a like mind that uh, a liberal arts education actually is, uh, uh, is, is, is important, arguably more important today uh, than ever before. C can you talk a little bit about sort of, and, and as, you, yeah, as you read about higher ed, um, you know, this real focus on STEM, which is great and certainly important, but can you talk a little bit about, uh, about the import, importance of a liberal education to, to a young person, uh, no matter what fields they're going into? Well, I'm, I'm probably very biased, but I thought, uh, and I still think it is extraordinarily important to study history, to study literature. I had a few classes in Greek and Roman literature um, uh, that that's carries with me. If you could see the books in this room, uh, you'd see uh, the classics over here and the classics in history there and the classics in political science there uh, and, and, and in nature and the environment to learn all of those things that other people have written about, talked about, experienced, theater, Shakespeare, all of those things. Um, I, I, I probably didn't fully appreciate what was happening when I was at Pacific. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, I, I, I do now, uh, and I do think about and remember and think about the enrichment of all of those opportunities to learn things that expose me to other worlds, other times, other periods, other ways of writing, other ways of thinking, uh, philosophy and things of that nature are, are exceedingly important rather than if you're going to be a math major or a science major or a pharmaceutical major, just studying those things that are in your field in later life, it's going to be very, very important to have the ability to think about experience and understand other times and other lives uh, and other experiences. Well, well, well said. We have so many students on the line with us today. Can you, and this is hard to sum up, but what, as you're talking to these young people at, at your university at Pacific, what advice would you have for them? As they, and many of them are now preparing over the course of the next few months or the next few years to, to start their careers. What, what advice might you, uh, might you tell them? Well, I, I, it's very hard to do because and it sounds very pompous to try to even try to do that. Um, young, this is, uh, it's been a long time and young people have different communications devices, they have different experiences, they have different opportunities, but I suspect um, that one of the things that hasn't changed very much is, especially at a place like Pacific, is the opportunities to deal with different people, to work with different people, to experience different people. And I'm not talking just about the classroom and I'm not just talking about the theater or the debate team uh, or, or, or the other things I'm talking about, the young people that you get to socialize with. I, I have such fond memories of the students that I enjoyed Pacific with. And in part, it wasn't the parties, uh, although, um, and of course I can't remember the parties, but um, the, the, the opportunity to work with people, to put together a newspaper or put together a debate team or put together a theater environment um, and to learn from other people uh, that, that, so my, my advice, I guess, is take all of the opportunities that you can, gorge yourself on the opportunity to do things different, try things that you may not think that you're good at. You might turn out to be better at it than you think. And also, failure is not something to be afraid of. Uh, it is a lesson. You learn things from your failures in a way more than you learn with, from your successes. So take chances, do things, 
open yourself up to as many opportunities as you can, you'll later in your life, you'll be so glad that you did that. Well, that is, that is terrific advice. And, and while selfishly I could, uh, I, I would happily monopolize all of our conversation. I, I wanna open it up to our students and faculty and staff and alums who have joined us. So with that, uh, I think Christopher is going to uh, see if we can orchestrate um, some, some conversations with our audience. That is correct. And so um, in the bottom middle, if you click the participants um, button, there is an option to raise hand. Um, and we actually have one raised hand right now. Uh, Tara Smithson, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tara Smithson. I am a student, third year student, and I'm also on the speech and debate team. So the question I have for you is, we talk a lot in forensics about how we're developing real world skills, especially in policymaking. And I was just wondering what ways forensics has influenced your career? I couldn't even begin in a few minutes to, to, to answer that question. It's just about everything. Uh, what I found on the forensics team uh, is that I love to research, uh, to try to find answers to questions on both sides of issues. I love the idea that we would organize argument and Paul Winters was a great, great, great teacher to teach us the art of persuasion. He called it the art of persuasion, beautiful and just. Are you still using that for expression? Um, to take uh, to to learn how to speak, to learn how to improve. Every time we went to a tournament, and and Paul Winters had us. I don't know if it's the same now, but he had us entering every single conceivable individual event, debate, interpretive reading, impromptu, extemporaneous speaking, radio speech, sales speech, uh, after dinner speech, everything, because he wanted to collect points so he could get the uh, the win the, the sweepstakes awards in the tournament. So you were doing everything. Um, and, and the idea of listening to other people. As I went to law school, uh, and many other professions are like this, communications is everything. You're writing, um, and you're trying to persuade somebody. You're trying to persuade a judge. Uh, you're writing a legal opinion. You're trying to persuade your clients. Uh, you're making an argument in court. Uh, you're making an argument to try to win an opportunity to handle a case uh, by talking to clients. All of those things are involved in the forensics team. Uh, and it's an intellectual study. It isn't just fun, although it is a great deal of fun. It's a great deal of work, but it's an education every step of the way. And so every tournament um, was, was a lesson um, I studied a lot of literature when I was doing interpretive reading. I, I, I had a, a year where I was just doing um, a poetry from African-American poets, Langston Hughes and people like that, to learn their experience. And I learned a lot from that. And there were other types of things that I did in the interpretive reading parts of it. So I could go on and on, but I think it is the most wonderful thing. And the fact that Pacific, instead of at a place like um, University of Southern California or something like that, where there's hundreds of people that maybe want to do it. At Pacific, um, we welcomed everybody that walked up and raised their hand, said they want to be on the team. They were given a spot on the team and an opportunity to be a participant. Um, so uh, I hope your appetite is good for that sort of thing because it's a great opportunity to learn so many different ways. All right, thank you so much. And next up, um, we are gonna continue along with student questions um, for Arisha uh, Senparthi, class of 22. Thank you. Um, so I'm also a third year and I'm also on the speech and debate team. I kind of have a similar question, but as someone who um, is a little bit interested in going into law as well, how did those skills that you acquired from being in the forensics team help you in the court? Well, let me st start off by saying it helped me in the classroom. Um, law school is an experience that, that I'll say this, I'll <laughs> make a slight uh, digression. Uh, one of my roommates at law school was a classmate from Los Altos High School. Uh, and we went to the first day of uh, classes at uh, Berkeley Law um, and he went to one little orientation class and I went to another one, it wasn't so little, it was a lot of people in the class. 
And he came back to the apartment and, and uh, said, what did you think of it? Um, uh, and I said, well, tell me, German, what did you think of it? And he said, I hated it. It was awful. The professors were asking questions and making people uncomfortable uh, and at this, that, and the other thing. And he, he said he dropped out that day and went to business school. And I said, that's amazing because I loved it. Uh, I love the fact that the professor was putting the students on the spot. The professors were asking you questions. Well, why do you think this? And what do you think about that? If someone said this, it was a, an opportunity to be in a room where people were thinking and trying out ideas. Um, and so the whole law school experience was like that. So if you don't like that sort of thing, then maybe law school is not the place to go unless you're going to be a tax lawyer or something like my wife would kill me for saying that because she's a tax lawyer but um but how did it prepare me for being in court it, it, one of the things um and i won't go on too long about this is one of the things if you're going to be making an argument in court you'd better understand the other side as well as your own side and one of the things that uh, forensics and debate taught was to listen and learn about the other side because you're gonna to have to make that other argument uh, uh, the next hour. So you have to be a uh, facile with the arguments and the facts and the history um, and the logic that's being presented on the other side. If you do that, you can make a coach because judges don't wanna be lectured to. They want to have a conversation in which you address the issues and the arguments and the evidence and that sort of thing. Juries are like that too. Uh, uh, lots of people think that it's just haranguing or giving long speeches to juries. No, they wanna have a conversation with you. They want to be talked to as if, because they are adults um, and because they're intelligent people, they wanna be treated respectfully and they want an uh, argument that addresses the issues straight on. Uh, and, and debate to help, help teach us how to do that. And one of the classes that Paul Winters taught was a, case, a course called argumentation. The students would have to come in with a proposition and they would have to give a piece of evidence um, or several pieces of evidence to support their contention. And then other people in the class would pick apart that evidence and they would get points if you could find flaws in the, in the arguments that the, the first speaker was making. So that taught you uh, to think about the arguments that you're making and think about the holes in those arguments. All of that helps in, in, in the practice of law. Thank you so much. All right. Um, next up, Dave and Margaret Fredrickson. You've you had your hand up for a little while. If you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Good morning, Ted. Hi. This is your fraternity brother. <laughs> Uh, so I thought I recognized that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm at that point where I'm watching you from afar. I'm out here now, you know. So, uh, but uh, I think that one of the things that uh, I've found among my students here over the years is that they don't really have a good feeling for why they should come to Washington and go into public service. And uh, as you and I know, it's a wonderful opportunity and a great life. And maybe you could uh, give them some idea of why being in the swamp isn't all bad. I'd be happy to do that. I, I came to Washington with President Reagan uh, in 1981. I had worked on his campaign and one of my partners um, became attorney general and the opportunity and Ronald Reagan was a client of ours so and I wrote his blind trust when he became president so it was, it was a great opportunity I was reluctant to leave my practice in Southern California looking over the ocean um, and and uh, the beautiful life and weather in California but I thought I can't miss the opportunity uh, to be a part of what goes on in Washington and to learn from it as time went by I went to go back to visit my colleagues at the law firm who were in the same office in the same place doing the same thing. I'm not intending to denigrate that at all, but I was thinking uh, you're, not, you're not growing as an individual if you continue doing the same thing that you're successful at uh, and, you're, and you need from time to time to do different things in different places with different people. 
Uh, the gov government experience in public service, whether it be in Washington or Sacramento uh, or Albany or someplace that is wonderful because it, it introduces you to other people, new people, new ideas that will become a, a wider circle of your friends for the rest of your life. Uh, an exciting way to look at things and to solve problems and to grow individually uh, and to serve your country. You're not getting paid as much as you might if practicing law and privately or in business or something like that, but you're enriching yourself, uh, your circle of friends, your experiences, your opportunities, and the people that I worked with that first experience in the Justice Department in the Reagan administration are people that are friends to this day. Many of them became clients. Uh, many of them became members of law school faculties. Uh, many of them became in the journalism field or, or one thing or the other in business world, uh, but they became friends and acquaintances and you learn so much more. It ri uh, widens your horizons. And as I said earlier, taking chances, possibly making mistakes, possibly failing, but learning from those experiences is an enriching opportunity. And I do encourage very, very strongly uh, people to participate. It doesn't have to be in government. It might be in a religion. It may be in a civic uh, uh, opportunity. It may be in teaching. It, you may take some time off to teach or teach part-time or something like that. But to do something different in your life and not to do the same thing all along is something that I've found uh, is very, very beneficial. Thank you so much for that. Next up, we have another student, Stephanie Torres, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi, um, my name is Stephanie Torres. This is my second year at Pacific and I'm also on the speech and debate team at Pacific. Um, my question for you I is- I can tell it's gonna be a great year for the speech and debate team. <laughs> Yes. Um, and my question to you is, you've talked about how you've done these multiple different tours of event. I'm just curious as to what you would say was your favorite event and why. You mean a favorite event at Pacific? Yeah, like competition wise. Oh, well, I, I, oh, the favorite event on the speech team was debate because I like the competition, the idea that you're pitting yourself, you and your colleague, we did it to, to I don't know how things have changed. We had a, uh, I had a debate colleague for two years, John Beyer, who was president of uh, University of Pacific, uh, I mean, president of the student body, passed away earlier this year. He was a wonderful person. But we had a, such a great, great group of people. We helped one another out. As you know, you're practicing debates with your members of your team. But the competition of debate, of putting yourself at one o'clock on the affirmative side of trying to make the most successful presentation and then on the other side at three o'clock or something like that and in each case adapting to what the other side is saying what you read in the face of the judge so it is a competition all of the time uh, in a way that um, the athletic uh, students experience once a week or some whenever there's a basketball game or something like that but we were experiencing it every two hours uh, and I saw so I, that was my favorite part of the forensics team, just being involved in debate. But the other events were very important too. I remember participating in an event called Discussion, where you were uh, put, a, put together with eight or 10 other people and you'd talk about in front of judges um, solving a problem. And then you'd go to another round with another judge and so forth. And it taught you to collaborate to negotiate, to be a participant in a group without alienating the other people, but at, at, in, in, at develop um, a, an ability to sort of bring the group along to your point of view, because you're going to be judged on how you did that. that and then oratory. I thought it was great experience to do oratory, to think about an issue of which you could make a passionate, time-limited speech about some social issue or some intellectual issue. All of those things were great, but debate stuck out, sticks out in my mind as the favorite thing. If you're going to be a lawyer, that's the best. Wonderful. And so we've had a number of students here who are on the speech and debate team. I also see a number of former debate alumni, Raul Kennedy and Douglas Pipes on here. And we actually oh, wow. even have um, our current speech and debate 
debate coach Steven. Um, so if I could uh, highlight you and have you ask a question. Hi, Ted. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I think my, my question is to get back to something you noted about Dr. Winters and his emphasis on diversity in, on the team and diversity of opportunity. Um, and I know that sometimes we live in such a polarized world that it's hard to think about how uh, the Solicitor General for the Bush administration is also arguing for DACA children and um, really this idea that your uh, ability to argue doesn't necessarily determine your uh, political affiliation. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to the impact uh, being immersed in a diverse setting uh, both in college and perhaps as a professional has had on your career and your ability to um, be successful and also uh, get to the humanity of people maybe beyond the politics behind uh, their positions. I'd like to talk about that. Thank you for asking me. And before I do that, Raul Kennedy and Doug Pipes were the greatest. Um, and of course, national champions and hugely successful individuals. They, they brought so much to the team. Uh, Raul and I, and we overlapped, I think, for a very short period of time, but not so much. But I followed their successes and their career. Uh, it's just great to hear their names. The diversity thing, um, and I know I shouldn't say diversity thing, that the Paul Winters believed in it down to his toenails. I mean, he believed that if you bring diverse people together, we will learn from one another in many different ways. We will learn about one another. We will be open, more open to other points of view, other backgrounds, other, um, uh, other cultures. Um, and, and we had on our debate team, as Raul and, and Doug could say, we had people of every different background. I'm not going to start picking out people uh, and identifying them by their background and that sort of thing, but it was unbelievable. And, and Paul Winters, as I recall, was one of the very first coaches of a debate team in intercollegiate debate that said, why aren't the women allowed to participate in the men's division for debate? Uh, and he defied the other coaches and sent two of our wonderful um, female debaters into the men's division. And, and he, his view was they can compete every bit as good as the men can. And there's no reason why they can't do that if they want to do that. We were recruiting all the time. He was looking, he was a talent scout. Look for somebody who was capable of doing this or this, someone from this perspective and so forth. So we had the most richly diverse group of individuals, I think, at the high number where there was over 30 people uh, on the team, many of whom traveled to certain of the tournaments, the ones that were closest uh, uh, around. And we, we developed friendships and relationships that I think are, I talked about the intellectual gratification of being on the team, the emotional gratification in those friendships probably is every bit up there at the top uh, along with everything else that I've talked about. That meant a great deal to me, and it has meant a great deal to me in my law firm uh, and in my practice. And you mentioned the DACA case. I also, as you know, probably many of you know, handled the challenge to the same-sex marriage prohibition, Proposition 8, in California, which we took on, uh, and it lasted five years, uh, and we represented same-sex individuals, uh, and we ultimately won in the Supreme Court. We helped change the law in the United States about the relationship or the rights of individuals to marry the person that they loved, uh, irrespective of their sexual background or sexual uh, orientation or sexual discipline. Uh, and that was another thing where some people were saying, well, how, how does that relate to being a conservative? And I could go on and on about that, but it was very important as an advocate to represent individuals. In the DACA case, the dreamers, we spent an enormous amount of time uh, in rooms and on, um, uh, on calls like this, Zoom calls, with individuals who would tell us about their experience, what country they came from, when they came, what their families were. We even brought one of the dreamers uh, in who had been successful at becoming a lawyer. And we had him admitted to the bar of the Supreme Court of the United States. And he sat next to me during the argument in the United States Supreme Court 
and and I, we didn't make an announcement of it, but the clerks knew, and I, therefore the law, the just justices knew that sitting in front of them was someone who was a dreamer, a DACA recipient, who was a practicing lawyer and the first person ever to become a member of the Supreme Court bar, sitting there in the United States Supreme Court, helping the argument to support the dreamers in that case. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Next up, uh, we have another current student, Angelica Guzman. You want to unmute yourself? Hi, so my name is Angelica Guzman. I'm a first year at Pacific and I'm also on the forensics team. And I found, <laughs> I found it to be a little challenging to you know, juggle work, school, and the forensics team. And I just want if you have any advice you know, in pursuing a career in law and as far as time management goes. Well, I, I found that it was enormously time consuming. Um, and, and by the way, we had, uh, Paul Winters was not going to accept anybody uh, who walked into a debate tournament unprepared. I mean, we had to be prepared. We had practice debates and we had uh, discussions with him and so forth. And we had to do our work. We had to have enough respect for the team, for the discipline to be prepared. So it was time consuming and it took a lot of time. I don't know how I did it, but I had time to do that and to be the editor of the newspaper uh, and participate in student government and play bridge all night, two nights a week at the fraternity. I found time to do all of those things and I think you will too. Um, it's a lot of work, but the payoff is, is, is worth it. Um, and I think time went by fast and yes, sometimes we were tired, but you're young, you can handle that. So you don't need as much sleep as maybe I do. But, but I think if you, if you enjoy what you're doing, um, you will find a way to get it done. All right, that is great advice. Um, and so let's go ahead and turn this over back to our president, uh, Christopher Callahan. Okay, thank you, thank you, Christopher. And we will, um, this has just been such a wonderful, wonderful hour with, with, with Ted Olson. Um, I'm going to wrap up with just one question. Um, uh, and if I could, so Ted, as, as you know, uh, the university is, we're in the final stretches of our Leading with Purpose campaign. Um, uh, and, and, and we believe it is more important now than ever before to remember what, what guides us. So if you could, and this is a hard assignment, but if you could in a single sentence, can you tell us what is your purpose? Well, that is a very, very hard question to answer uh, in one sentence. Um, I, I sus there's many ways to answer that and there's many purposes. Um, one of the most important ones is to live life to the fullest. Uh, as you get, I, I put a comma there so I could make it all one sentence. Um, as you get to a certain point in your life, you realize what everybody's been telling you all along that life seems at, at, at that point remarkably short. Uh, but to have the, the purpose is to get as much as you can out of the experiences that life affords you uh, in terms of your surroundings, in terms of your colleagues, in terms of your profession, whatever it might be, and particularly in terms of your families. When tragedies occur as they will, you'll realize that your family and your close friends are the comfort that you will be able will help you survive. Uh, and so all of those things are important, but it's wrapped up in uh, your life experiences and don't let any of it um, drift away without having some, uh, uh, some fulfillment for uh, your life. Now, that was a pretty long sentence. Uh, the, um, the grammar um, people among us would probably <laughs> criticize that, but that's the best I could do. We, 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 we appreciate that, Ted. Um, I, I, I want you to know this has just been such a fantastic, fantastic opportunity for our students. We've had so many students on the line, but we've also, as you've seen, had alumni. We've had our faculty and staff here. We've had regents and former regents. Uh, this has just been such a marvelous turnout um, and, and, and just such an enriching experience for, for all of us, particularly at this point in time. Um, I, I, 
Ted and I were lamenting a little bit the difficulties of, of Zoom is you don't get to really hear people um, um, as, as you're speaking. So if, if I could, if Christopher, if there's a way to just sort of un, un, unmute everybody, if we could, and if we could have a, um, I don't know if, I should have asked beforehand how easy this is to do. Um, um, yeah, we're, we'll it, ask it, everyone to unmute themselves right okay. now. And then um, we're going to have a little bit of instruction of what we're going to do once everyone's unmuted. Well, all I all, it, it, all I want to do is have an actual audible um, uh, specific round of applause for Ted Olson. Uh, there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that that is great. I very much appreciate that. I will I will feel good about that for a long time. That really <laughs> matters to me, and I look forward as we were just. Ted's on mute. There we go. <laughs> oh, well, what I was saying is, I look forward once the pandemic is behind us, as I hope it will be soon. Uh, I, I would love to come back to Pacific um, and spend some time with uh, the administration, the faculty, and the students um, for a weekend or something like that. That would be very gratifying. Well, we would be honored, and we're going to be all looking forward to that, Ted. Um, thank you again so, so much. Wonderful, a, a wonderful way to spend the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Be well.